there's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking just rocking in a way that's true if you know what i mean just take a look at the senior scene well it's rocking yeah, it's rockin'. I'm Gary Roseman, and I'm directing UNC's Partnerships and Aging Program, which I'll tell you more about a little bit later <coughs> in the program. And I'm joined by my favorite colleague, Amy Gorley. Yes. Amy is the Vice President of Outreach and Strategy at Carolina Meadows. And we have run the same circles now for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So we're delighted to... So our topic is Be Bold, Playing Old, and we want that title to compel you to be curious, and we'll, um, as time goes on, you'll learn a little bit more about what that means. So today's agenda, be talking about ageism and framing it up and asking the question, how did we get here? An assumption that we make starting out that we live in a society that's ageist, and we want to collectively learn about what that means and looks like for us as individuals and more broadly for us as a society. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, calling into question, are our perceptions about aging aligned with the reality as we know it? And here I'll bring in some research that may inform our thinking. We'll um, engage you to think about how did you get your ideas about aging and how are they influencing you now? Just as a little tidbit, we know that people who have positive perceptions about aging live seven and a half years longer than those who don't. So we'll keep that in mind as we go forward. And then um, we'll finish with a launch of the Be Bold, Claim Old campaign and propose to you some ideas about how we all might be bold and claim old. The stereotype of aging tends to be characterized by old people are sad and sick. That paradigm is one that we got to probably for several reasons. And I would like to propose to you four major categories and reasons why we can think back on how we got to the idea that um, fighting our age is a noble thing to do and fearing our age because we too may think that aging is full of sadness and sickness. So how did we get here? I think there's a historical perspective that goes way back to Neolithic cultures where old people were set aside when they could no longer contribute to the tribe or the society. Not just set aside, but left to die. And that idea persisted into Native American times, where in, um, in some Native American tribes that was also something that happened. But it's interesting that that, in the Native American culture, ran alongside a respect for elders, respect for the wisdom and experience that elders could bring to the conversations and the actions in the tribe. So you start to see a little bit of shift or a little bit of, well, what's really going on here in terms of um, historically how we acted um, and thought about age. I want to suggest to you that a second factor is what I call a dependency bias. So I just invite you to think about whether how we're doing as a society for people that have needs people who have disabilities, children who have special needs. How are we doing? Are those people marginalized? Are they supported by our policies and our structures? And I would say that I think historically, we came up at a time when the discovery of America was predicated on being rogue, being individualistic, fighting the norm. And from there, we really held tight to that individualistic idea. However, that's um, not a bad thing in itself. Yep, we're all responsible for ourselves, like to take care of ourselves. However, um, we, that sometimes comes as the prevailing paradigm when really I think more and more we must recognize how we are all interconnected. That my actions affect yours, that policies affect people in different ways and their trade-offs and costs and balances 
all the way around the circle, but fundamentally we are connected to each other. But with this dependency bias, it creates an opportunity for a we they thinking. Those old people, they're different than I am. I'll never get there. Anti-aging. And that depend our, our society's outlook on dependency really colors how we think about age. A third thing is our public policy. So back in the 60s, we remember, I remember. Medicare coming into being and Social Security coming into being. And it was based on those policies that was based on were based on age. Well, age at the time, 65, there are not many people that lived that long. So it was fairly reasonable to set public policy based on age when not many people even reached that age. Well, fast forward 50, 60 years, and we now have a longevity that we've never had before in history. The average lifespan is 85. So um, we must call into question these public policies that tend to support the idea that when you reach a certain age, you fall off the map. Or when you reach a certain age, you should behave in a certain way. Or you reach a certain age and you become eligible for services and resources that you may not even need. So our public policies have tended to run alongside our views of aging. And no, the fourth thing, no secret to anyone, is the ways that our media promotes ageism. I mean, I was at getting my hair cut at Grey Clips the other day, and I, had, I was looking at a wall of products that were framed as anti-aging creams and potions. <laughs> and I was so offended by this idea that you don't want to grow older. Well. Um, marketing to anti-aging is uh, just pervasive. Even our own uh, AARP tends to have front covers of youthful celebrities and uh, titles like how you can look good and have sex well beyond 50. <laughs> so I think that our media is flooding us with uh, notions about aging that that may or may not be true for us as a population or for us as individuals. I would ask you, is there anything else that you think of um, that may contribute historically or um, for other reasons to our perceptions of what aging means? Yes. Personal observations. I, when I think about aging, I think of my grandmother who I thought was ancient and she died in her 70s. <laughs> okay, absolutely. So we've all had, and I, I, I'd love you to, I want to put the light on that comment a little bit later when I'll invite you all to think about your personal connections and observations and how they might have influenced you. So absolutely, thanks for bringing that forward. So let's take a closer look. Um, and I want to challenge are our perceptions about aging align with reality. And to start my thinking about this, I've gone back to a real local experience that we're having right now. Orange County Department on Aging is, um, has just completed its five-year master aging plan. And in order to do that, we gathered a lot of community input. And we did a survey of which we had over a thousand people respond. Those people were all over 55. And one of the questions we asked was, what are you worried about in your future? And the three things that we heard with the greatest prevalence were dementia, which some people said was memory loss. So we'll talk about that in a minute. The second most common answer was running out of money. People feared running out of money. And the third thing was needing help. So I've taken those three things that are said to be going on in the minds of people locally and challenge that and saying, well, so what does the research say about the likelihood of those fears being coming to bear? So what about dementia, memory loss, cognition loss, and the fears that we have around that? Well, I can say that I've scanned the current research literature and found citations that said 45% of people over 45, over 85 will get dementia. Like 
over half of us when we reach 85 will have dementia. Counter that with a similarly current research study that said 90% of people, prediction, 95%, 90% of people over 85 will be cognitively fit. So how do we, that's a huge discrepancy. 45% will have dementia, 90% will be cognitively fit. So I would like to propose to you that what that suggests is that we don't know how to define and identify cognitive loss. We tend to think of it in a binary way. You have dementia or you don't. And in fact, the Institute of Medicine's recent white paper suggests what I think we're going to see more and more of is that just like we all age in very unique ways, some of us say stronger in one way or another, but our aging process makes us more unique over time. And similarly, our cognition is also changing over time, probably starting when we're in our 30s. And the Institute of Medicine is suggesting that our cognitive changes happen incrementally over a long period of time, and there's no predicting what aspect of cognition will decline in which kind of people. So it's a little different paradigm about dementia or loss of cognition, but I think we really are at an early phase still in our research about dementia and what it, how it impacts your everyday life. You may have a diagnosis of dementia and still be able to completely function in your daily activities of dressing and going to the bathroom and doing the things that you need to do for your personal care, but may have trouble with navigating transportation or preparing a meal, etc. Point being that we fear dementia and the stereotype of becoming daffy as we get older is really up for grabs right now. We have a lot of work to do and a lot of research to help us more fully define and understand what that means. Meanwhile, it's something that was the number one fear voiced in Orange County. And interestingly, in a University of Chicago study of people in decades from the 30s to the 70s, the 40-year-olds said that losing their memory was the second most concern they had for the future. So it's not, a, it, the fear about dementia is not limited to people who are in the later part of their life. It really is also something people in their younger years are also thinking about. So a second paradigm that contributes to ageism is the idea that as you get old, you become a burden. You run out of money and need public support. Um, so what about that? Let's take a closer look at that. Some exciting research that is um, just being completed and actually updated now is uh, <coughs> done by Ken Dykewald, sponsored by the AARP. And his findings suggest that the longevity that we have right now will contribute to what he calls the, used to be eight, now $12 billion longevity bonus. So his work is looking at what are the habits of, he calls them retirees, even that word is up for grabs again, right? But what he's finding is um, the resources and time and money that our cohort have will change the world. And his example is that even now, 42% of the charitable giving happens in, from people who are over 65 years old. 45% of the volunteer time is also provided by older adults. So we have strength in numbers, we have strength in our longevity, we have more capital, more money, and more time than any other cohort ever before. And certainly, um, as we're looking now at millennials, um, it's the older adults that hold the purse strings and hold a lot of power for what happens. And I think this idea of ageism and running out of money and needing public assistance and being a burden is increasingly going to be
called into question, and that we can be really proud of um, those resources that we can offer and contribute back to society. And what about the piece of being sad and sick? And we, um, our need for help is something that we fear. I think some of that is because we don't always, it's not always clear where to find the help that we need. Interestingly, um, when you see need for help here, what does that call to mind for you? That you can't drive yourself to the grocery store or mm -hmm. anywhere. Yep, you might need help to do some really important things to help you connect with your community. Caregiving. <clears throat> A lot of people think about the need for personal caregiving, so daily things that you can't do yourself get um, or make you vulnerable. I want to say a little and a bit of an aside. When Orange County seniors at, said that they feared needing help, the follow-on in that question was help in their yard and home. So, <laughs> so it wasn't about being sick and frail and needing caregiving. It was about getting help for um, to maintain home and um, home and yard. That said. We have a lot of structures in place and a lot of um, financial investment in place to address this idea that we're going to really need a lot of caregiving. And Paul Cleaver has helped us to understand that most of us will have a period of active aging where we need a little help along the way when we have our hips replaced or um, a fall, but that the period of time that we fear the most, which would mean needing care to the extent of nursing home care is really a very short period of time. For women, 3.7 years. For men, 2.2 years. So we really need to think about our aging in maybe two phases or, or more, about the time at the very end when we really do need extensive caregiving, but that as a group of aging individuals, the paradigm or the, the idea that we are people that are a burden and need help and need to be cared for really does not play out in the actual uh, literature that we see. I want to finish um, this part of the presentation by uh, talking about quality of life and another surprise to me where our perceptions and the reality don't actually align. So time and again, study after study, we see that the people that report the highest quality of life are old and young. And it really forms a new curve. The people in middle age are the people that are reporting the poorest quality of life. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, in spite of the laundry list of things, reasons that you could point to why quality of life might not be so good, the people who are living it and breathing it and wearing their age are saying, I have good quality of life. So, how, can we, how do we explain that? Ashton Applewhite says she explains that by our ability to adapt, our resiliency, our ability to deal with fear and anger and other emotional states that um, are really not contributing to overall well-being. So um, that's a little bit of history on maybe how we got to be at this place in our thinking about age. And now I'm going to ask you to think about your own age individually and how you got the ideas that you have about your own aging. And to do that, I'm going to set the example by sharing my story of how I came to think about my own aging and tell you about my Uncle Jack. My Uncle Jack, who's, who at 83, after being the person in our family who asked everyone for money over many, many years, became a millionaire by selling golf umbrellas. And that happened in 83. Um, my father, whose name is Krusty, is 93, and he's still working three-quarter time. Several years ago when I said, could you give me any help um, I want to go back to school. He said, oh no, I'm going to retire. Well, he was 62 then. So he's continued to work and um, really sort of cut through my idea of retirement and what that looks like. 
The next person I want to tell you about is Doris. I moved in to uh, live in a room. I rented a room in Doris's house when I was 28, and she was 85. And I was going back to school, and I said to myself after I signed the lease, oh my gosh, what have I done? I'm going to be ending up spending my time not studying, but taking care of Doris. Well, Doris lived to be 102. She became my best friend. She named my daughter and I was with her the night she died. So she really broke through my idea of what age was by living, um, by the privilege of living with her for four years and then being a friend for the next 14. Um, 61, that's me, and I want to share that right now I have my dream job at 61. In a t at a time in history when people who lose their job at 40 are really worried mm -hmm. and worried that they'll be able to still be viable in the workplace. So I'm excited to be able to say that at this phase in my life. And 87 brings me to the story of my mother who last week refused our offer to come to North Carolina from Florida to get away from Irma the hurricane. Mm -hmm. Irma was my grandmother's name, her mother's mm -hmm. name, by the way, so there was this sort of funny connection. Um, my mom's 87, and so we, three kids, were like, we decided to stay in your home. And the next day, when I called her and said, what would you do today? She said, well, I put 45 sandbags up against the windows and doors to protect our home. And that just blew my mind. She, the ferocity that she had to, to want to stay in her home and what she brought to bear was just, again, sort of punch through this idea of age and what's possible and how a number really does not have the meaning that we sometimes give it. So that's my story. I would love to hear, as I've been chatting away, what, if any of you have thought of anyone in your life who might have helped you to think differently about the number how many birthdays people have. I'm very interested in aging in place, but I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to pull it off. Um, but And I have a lot of friends, almost all of my friends right now are signing up for CCRCs. And it's just not something I want. But there is a lady in my neighborhood who lives oh, six houses away from me, who is 94 years old and who is aging in place and who walks every day to Weaver Street to get her dog and her cat food and her um, her milk and you know that, that kind of thing. So to me she's an inspiration that if she can do it, maybe I can do it. <laughs> I'll share. I'll, I'll be 75 this month um, and I'm just astonished. <laughs> that I'm here, you know, that this can happen. That's three quarters of a century old is what I keep thinking. How did I get here? Um, and I, I'm reactive. I do notice, you know, my body is um, less vigorous than it used to be, that's for sure. I notice that I um, generally after lunch I want to take a nap. I want to fall asleep for a while. Um, and I remember that about my dad. My dad just passed away a year and a half ago. He lived to be 98. And he was always napping during the day, but he was independent, lived at home, aged in place, with a lot of help from his family. But on the other hand, so I had that example of him, and he was, he remained pretty, um, his mind remained quite well, quite engaged. On the other hand, most of the people on both sides of my family died long before they got to be 75 and tell me now. So I feel like, hmm, um, I don't have, I have the example of, of my dad, and I can certainly remember when I was young and my grandparents were alive, um, what they were like, but they weren't really very old, in fact, I realize now, because they died 
before 75. So it's a real, this birthday is of great significance to me. <laughs> it's just making me question everything. Sounds like you're very grateful. Yes. My dad lived to be nine. As a kid, he had polio. He had TB. He had a stroke. But he was very mentally active, but very physically uh, limited throughout his life because he had polio in 1910 and the uh, medical studies, uh, study of the art at that time, he just basically had to outlive it. Uh, mentally active, did uh, accounting tax work. In fact, when he died at 90, a few days later, someone had sent him a check for tax return to be prepared for. <laughs> My mother, on the other hand, lived to be 91. Longer, but 11 years of long silence. Oh and the steady, day by day, down mm -hmm. And the loss of mental capacity. And the person that was there, physically, mentally was not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So, to me, longevity, it's a two-edged sword. Yeah. There's pleasant parts of it and some very difficult parts of it and very expensive parts of it mm -hmm. if you're going the dementia route for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good place. Thank you for sharing that. And a good place to say that we're not trying to promote the successful aging idea that if you can climb mountains and tightrope until some long age, that's not the point. The point is what's possible. The point is that we all have something to celebrate at every age and that it may not be apparent. It may not be the overt things. It may be my heroes who don't have financial resources struggle with health issues and still maintain vibrant, brilliant relationships with their family. So that is, an, there are all ways where our age does and doesn't matter, but to not, for us to not think that the number tells the story is really what, what I want to stop now and turn over to Amy Corley to help us expand that idea of wonderful There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking just rocking in a way that's true if you know what I mean just take a look at the senior scene well it's rocking yeah it's rocking we're pulling our weight learning the code